What's up, friends? Dan Vega here, and today we are talking about the response entity class in Spring Framework. So this all started from a tweet. I sent out this tweet, didn't think much of it, and it picked up a lot of traction. So I want to take some time and go through. We'll take a look at the tweet, discuss that, and then we'll jump into kind of the Spring Framework API docs, look at what a response entity is, and we'll finally kind of wrap this all up by taking a look at a code example. Again, what we want to get through in this video is just learn what the response entity is and when it might be appropriate to use it in your own project. So what are we waiting for? Uh, let's go ahead and jump right in. All right, so here's the tweet I sent out. I said, I often see Spring developers returning a response entity and not manipulating the response. If all you're going to do is this and just return the body, just return that as the return type. If you need to customize the response and you need to add headers or change the status code, you can use a response entity as the return type. That was my tweet. Here we are, 600 likes later, 57 retweets, and a whole bunch of, uh, of comments. So I want to take a look at this. Well, we, I don't want to get into the screenshot because we're going to do this in the tutorial. I guess what I want to talk about next is really what is a response entity? So if we go over to the API docs, we can see that it's an extension of the HTTP entity that adds an HTTP status code. Uh, this is used in the REST template as well as in add controller methods. Um, and then down here you can see this also can be used in Spring MVC as the return value from a controller method. Now again, REST controller uh, is just a derive is just a combination of um, if you look underneath the hoods, it, it uses the add controller annotation. So that's the same thing. So what we're going to be building today is a, a little bit of a REST API. So we'll see that here. Um, so what we're going to do is build this out. And I want to just kind of take a look at the difference. So with that, let's head over to IntelliJ. Here I am in IntelliJ. I have just a simple project that I've already started. Uh, we actually got into this on Spring Office Hours yesterday. If you are not following Spring Office Hours, I'll go ahead and leave a link to that below. But it's just a weekly show that me and my friend Deshaun do. And it's a chance for us to find out like what's new in the Spring community. And we just go through some of the stuff that we're working on. So right now, what Deshaun and I are working on is a project that we're using as part of a four-hour workshop on getting started with Spring Boot. So this is an activity tracker we both like to run, so we figured we'd model it around that domain. So I have this run tracker, and I just have a couple of runs in here. Um, so it just takes in the title. So like, hey, this is a Tuesday morning run or a Wednesday evening run. And then it takes a start time and a finish time. Uh, this will expand on this later, but this is just kind of the base of it. So I have two runs in there. Now I have an activity controller. And in this activity controller, I have a field called activity repository. And this will get uh, through constructor injection. And this activity repository is just a spring data repository that is going to give us some CRUD functionality. So with that, what I want to do is create a new method that allows me to get all of the activities uh, in the database. So I'm going to go ahead and create a get mapping. Again, I already have a request mapping of slash API slash activity. So I'm going to create a get mapping here. And we'll just say that's to this. And then what I want to do is say I'm going to return a list of uh, activities. Sorry, I said post because that was the one in the tweet. And we'll call this find all. And this will just return a uh, the activity repository dot find all. So if we were going ahead, if we went ahead and run this, uh, this should start up fine. We can go back to the browser and go to localhost 8080 slash API slash activity. Oops. And if you see that, we get our uh, array of activities. So each activity has an ID, title, started, and completed. So this is what I normally do, right? This is what I normally do in my APIs. What I was saying is that I usually, OK, I won't say usually. I will say I have been seeing this lately. So they'll change, we'll change the response type, the return type to response entity. And of course, this is going to still return a list of activities. And so what I'm, I've been seeing here is you can come in here and just say, 
Okay, I want to return a response entity dot okay, which is a status of 200. And the body of it is just going to be that activity repository dot find all. So that is what I've been seeing, and that was kind of the reason I've sent out that tweet. Now, if we go ahead and uh, go ahead and run this and take a look at the browser, we get the same exact result. So no matter what you are returning here, whether it's a list of activity or a response entity of list of activity, the end result is the same same result. Uh, so even if we were to go ahead and look at that in, say, a terminal. So let's go ahead and open up a terminal here. And let's go ahead and run HTTP 8080 uh, slash API activity. You will see that we get a 200. Um, here's our headers. Content type is application JSON. And there's our array of runs. So the return type doesn't matter here. Uh, we haven't changed anything. Now, when a response entity is useful, again, is when you want to manipulate uh, the status code or change some headers. So let's go ahead and just uh, change this to null for now. And what I want to do is go ahead and create a new header. So I might say HTTP headers. We'll call this response headers. And this is new, HTTP headers. And now what I can do is go ahead and add a new response header. So I'll just add a my custom header. And then this is my custom value. So now I have some response headers here. I can go ahead and add this using response entity. So I might say new response entity. And this is uh, of type, so we don't need to set the type there. So this is a new response entity. Um, and then what, what are we adding here? So we first need to add the body. So we can do that by saying the activity repository dot find all. Now we are setting the headers. Uh, we can see in here there's a multi-map string string of headers. So we can go ahead and add our headers here. And then we're going to set the response code. In this case, it's the raw status code of 200. So this is the situation where you would want to use response entity because if I just returned a list of activities, there's no way for me to add a new header there. Um, so this will come up. And in this case, this makes sense. So let's go ahead and restart this. I want to go back to the terminal. And let's just clear this out. And I'm going to move this up just a little. And let's say that again. Now you can see in the response, we have a status of 200. And then we have that my custom header and that custom value that we set. Again, the return type is still just an array of our activities. Um, in this case, uh, a list of our activities, right? So that's what I wanted to say. The other thing that came up was, hey, what if, you know, what if I just want to change the response? Well, I do this often in, say, a, um, a method where I'm going to create something, right? Like, so I may have a method that is um, public uh, activity, create a new one. I may take in a request body of an activity, so activity, activity. And then I may return, you know, the activity repository dot save and I pass in the activity. So in this instance, you can still just return the activity. You don't need to return the response entity. If you just want to change the status that is coming back, you can use the at response status annotation. And in this case, I would want to say that it was created. Um, and now I get back a 201 instead of a 200. That lets the caller know that, hey, this was indeed created. So that's one way to just change the response. Now, again, if this response is conditional on something and you need to uh, perform some logic to figure out what that status is, then, again, response entity is a good time to use. That, that's a good reason to use response entity. The other argument I heard was I'd like to be, I'd like to be consistent with my return types uh, and just return response entity every time. To that, uh, again, 
I think what I want to get across here too is if, if this is the this isn't a bad thing. If you're using response identity, don't worry about it. The, you don't need to go refactor your code. This was just something I wanted to kind of highlight in case folks weren't sure when to use response entity. So the idea of being consistent, I don't really follow because every method that I'm that I have is returning something different. Um, you know, I'm returning a list of activities, or I'm returning a single activities, or I'm not returning anything. So the idea that I need to be consistent and always return a response entity, when at the end of the day, the response entity is just returning what the body is, and the body is going to be a list or a single item or nothing, that doesn't really, I don't really understand the, the response there. So um, again, not a big deal. I, I just like to kind of have these discussions in public. I like to learn from you guys. Hopefully you learn from me. Uh, this was a really good discussion on when to use response entity. Uh, so I thought we would take the chance to go through it. So hey, if you found some value in this video, as always, friends, do me a big favor. Give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and as always, happy coding.